Brian manages the risk management program for a large public entity pool, that's IPMG in Illinois, and is a keynote speaker to a national, I did get this right, national and state associations in the fields of public entity and healthcare risk management. Has a few chocolate labs and a son graduating in May. Please help me welcome Mr. Brian Devlin. I, I'm, up, I'm up here. Good morning, everybody. I, God, I hate that bio. That was not written by me. Um, everybody asked for a bio, so you have to put your history together, and that's a little bit of where I came from. Um, to back up even further, when I went to school, um, college, I knew I was interested in anatomy and physiology. I knew I couldn't sit and be a doctor because I just didn't have the patience to go through school that long. Um, my wife-to-be was going to PT school, and I graduated in front of her by two years, and she was in the middle of the program, and so I thought, that kind of sounds good. Um, so I petitioned the school and the Board of Governors to see if I could start in the middle of the program, and I finished PT school in three semesters. It usually takes six semesters, but I was able to proficiency out of the um, other three. So it allowed me to graduate with my wife. Uh, we walked down the aisle together. Um, I told her as I was walking down the commencement aisle, I'm not going to be a PT. This is not going to be my career. She said, why did you go into this? I said, I knew I could get a job. And that was the truth of it, too. We got recruited a lot. Um, and when I first got out of PT school, I worked for a contract therapist company, and I provided therapy to a large global manufacturing company. And they had 3,000 employees on, their, um, on this particular campus, and uh, I did all of the injury uh, response and injury care for their injured workers. My first really, I guess, um, introduction to workers' compensation was I was treating a Hispanic gentleman, and a really, really nice guy, and he was in his 50s, and he had worked for this company for 25 plus years, and I was treating an, his hand amputation. He had his hand cut off in a mechanical press, and I was doing all the wound care and the debridement and trying to do everything that went along with his ADLs and making sure that his injury was taken care of. And I got brought into the insurance department, and they asked if I had any feedback or a commentary about the injury. Did he explain? Did he tell me what happened with the injury? And I said, well, certainly he did. He said, you know, he's got his can cut off the mechanical press. And um, they were interviewing some of his co-workers, too. Well, come to find out, he had told people and had planned to put his hand in that press, disable the safety switch, and cut his own hand off so it would pay for his kid's college education. So that's the depth that some people will go to and they see work comp as some type of vehicle or a supplemental pay option, and it just doesn't work that way. So that was really kind of just breathtaking to me that uh, someone would go to that length and, uh, and do such harm to themselves uh, to try to get some type of um, settlement that would help pay for the kid's college education. From there, I went to uh, a large hospital on the south side of Chicago, and uh, I was recruited there because they were starting an industrial medicine program. And I had a lot of, well, one-year history or experience of working in industrial medicine at that large global equipment manufacturer. So I went and I actually had to work at the hospital because they were building out the 28,000-foot 28 28, square or square foot um, center that we were going to do all the work hardening and all of the rehab in. So I had to work at the hospital for a year. So I was doing everything from acute care to wound care and uh, orthopedic care. And um, I kind of became a wound care specialist at that time. So I know kind of what infectious disease, I've been in negative pressure rooms, um, all the stuff that's happening with COVID, you know, the hand washing and people going into airplanes and sterilizing the armrests and the headrests and everything, we were doing that for the past decade, um, just because of the things that we came into encounter with with wound care. So um, from there, I did industrial medicine, and uh, Bob Tarver, who was the director of risk management at the hospital I worked for, came to me and asked and said, would you be interested in a side project? And I didn't know what the heck he was talking about, but he wanted to know if we could train a lift team to take the place of all the nurses that would do patient transfers and patient lifting, because it was just blowing out their backs. They were going through nursing bodies too much, and they were looking to see if we could design a specific lift team two young guys that were going to go and do a lot of the lifts that the, were scheduled throughout the day that the nurses had to do. So it would take a lot of the physical you know, burden away from the nurses and transfer it on to somebody else. Well, it was really, really successful. And 
we worked on that and piloted it for a year. Um, and it was actually called, on the budget, Clinical Application for Hospital Risk Management Injury Prevention, the IMH lift team. And we developed this over the course of six months. They used that for five years, and it had about a 35% reduction in nursing back injuries. That's huge, because that's where all the action is at when it comes to workers' compensation for health care. So that got, uh, that got me noticed from some of the insurance companies. I was recruited to a monoline work comp company, only did workers' compensation, health care. And we started looking at to see if we could bring that type of approach, like a lift team, to the standard market where nursing homes and senior care operate. So this monoline work comp company, that's all they did, was monoline work comp for senior care, long-term care, nursing homes, extended care. Um, and we got in there and we actually tried to see if we could engineer some type of lift assist program that would decrease nursing back injuries and CNA back injuries. So over the course of really 18 months, we basically did several samples of the acuity levels of these nursing homes to try to find out what the average baseline was of the acuity for a building because the acuity of a building, and that means how severe the care level is for a particular building. That changes, it's fluid. Um, some days it's more demanding, and then the next week it may not be, so you have to come up with these averages. So we found out that we could apply engineering controls in the form of mechanical lifts to take the place of a lot of the nurses doing the lifting and them injuring their backs. So when we put this program in place, it's called a limited lift program. We assign product champions, or CNAs that go through a lot of training on the equipment. I personally went put them through back school so they know how exactly how the back works, safe lifting techniques, good ergonomic ways to make sure that they follow um, good lifting strategies and make sure that they are well educated in patient transfers. When I went to PT school, I had to go through an entire semester of patient transfer training. That's how demanding it is. So we're really well qualified to be able to help CNAs and nurses out. So we put this lift program in place and it decrease back injuries by about 80% for nurses. That's remarkable, because nurses have the number two injury rate for backs out of all occupations. Truck drivers, number one, nurses, number two, bricklayers, number three, meat handling, meat processing is up there with number three as well. So that caught the attention of a lot of people. We went all throughout Illinois and the Midwest really implementing this limited lift program, and nursing homes loved it. Um, and then I got introduced to IPMG back in 2000, and well, actually it was 1997. And I worked with Greg Peterson, who's the president of our company. And uh, Greg was operating the ICRMT, which is the Illinois County Risk Management Trust. It's a public entity pool in Illinois. And uh, Greg and I did some work on nursing home business um, when I was with that other company, which is called Diamond Insurance. They're still in existence. It's a good company. And uh, he asked if I would come over and do something similar for a program that they manage, and, which is the ICRMT and trust called the LSN Trust, which was a workers' compensation trust for nursing homes. Really tough business to get workers' compensation right for nursing homes, or healthcare in particular. It's just tough, tough business. Uh, so I did that for a little while, but I started getting interested in public entity, because the more complicated the risk and the problem, the more interested I become in it. And uh, that's kind of what we are all about. We look for service levers to pull or to fold in that can either shape and influence a work comp claim or eliminate it from happening in the first place. So the more complicated the challenge and the environment, the more attracted that we are to it. Nursing home is very, very tough business for workers' compensation. Workers' compensation is tough in health care. Workers' compensation is very tough for public entities, tough for manufacturing. Um, it's a cycle. The market goes soft, it, goes, it gets hard. And um, it, the one thing that it's always going to do, though, it will be a cycle. You're going to have times where the insurance is very, very cheap and times where it's very, very expensive. But what you want to continuously do is develop your sophistication in your workers' compensation insurance management, and you can weather those cycles much better. So that was kind of where I started um, on that lift team. And then it expanded to where we really are today. Um, when I was at the hospital, I became a shoulder specialist, and uh, I had no interest in lumbar spines or back injuries. Just no interest in it at all. But the director of our department came to me and said, we need you to go for this special training. It's McKinsey training. We want you to go to Saunders School. 
and we want you to become a spinal specialist. And I said, I'm really good with the shoulder. I said, it's kind of a lot more interesting to me. I'm not that interested in becoming a spinal therapist. And he said that if you want a job, he said, uh, you're going to have to go to this. I said, well, what time's the class? And on I went. So I became Saunders educated and McKinsey trained and a spinal specialist. And uh, it was probably what drove me out of being a clinician, a physical therapist. Um, so many people have back injuries. Probably 80 to eight, to 8 or 9 out of 10 people in here have had some type of back pathology or pain in your life. So it's very, very common. So the people I, re I was seeing and I was treating had back problems. You know, We would correct them and they would come back to see us again. So it was just a cycle that was happening. And this is what I had to go to school to get really specialized and trained in. Um, the cubital body, the disc is where a lot of the times we see, you know, people have bulging disc or herniated disc. And all of a sudden, you know, the checkbook starts going and benefits start getting utilized. And it's really, really hard to get control of back pain because everybody has it. Um, you could do asymptomatic imaging on this entire room, and nine out of 10 of us would come back with an abnormal signal on our impression. It's arthritis, it's degenerative changes, it's the mom and dad gave us bad posture, gravity pulls us into that posture, it adversely wears the joints, and then it causes just decon deconditioning and deterioration. It's just natural, it happens. And that's what we were always trying to avoid, and uh, we were really interested in trying to make sure of stopping, because once someone has a herniated disc, they almost always usually have a surgery. Anybody ever had a herniated disc surgery in here? You people. It's tough stuff, isn't it? Misery. About 4% of all back injuries really result in a true disc herniation. Fibroid cartilage in the back of the disc are stronger than, than tensile steel, really. I mean, it has a tensile strength stronger than steel. So it's really, really hard to get that nucleus outside that center there and make it actually compress on those nerves, these things right here. It's the spinal cord and, oops. It's the spinal cord. Spinal nerves that break off that, and the middle comes out there and puts pressure on there, and then that's when things go haywire. People have to have surgery. You have to have go through a lot of therapy to increase your core and the abdominal muscles so you can have an abdominal bracing and make sure that back stays in neutral spine. This is one of my former patients. <clears throat> he brought that up to me, and I said, put that on the back light, and I said, you go back, back to your doctor. There's nothing I can do for you. This, this person had to have surgery within 24 or 48 hours. That's a, disc, that's a danger of paralysis. That's how bad that disc herniation is. So this is just an MRI, and then this is a myelogram of another patient of mine. You can see the disc herniation out here. And these are all common in work comp. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have had experience with people who have had back injuries in work comp. It's probably one of the more frustrating injuries that we have to deal with because it's so ambiguous that there's so many people that have back pain and you know comes and goes. And, People can get attached to that, you know what, my back pain is a part of the job, and it, it may, be, may be made worse by the job, but it was there before. So when we started looking at this, you know, the stretching, ergonomics, awkward postures, excessive force, static loading, we can train on that, we can create policies on it, we can engineer out a lot of this activity. But what we've started finding more and more of, that this decreased fitness and poor metabolic health really causing a lot of the severity or complexity of back injuries that we were finding in work comp. So you can imagine my frustration. We're trying to put these policies and procedures together to make safe work environments, decrease a lot of the lifting, and improve injury prevention. But a lot of the times, the behavioral choices of the individual is actually what's going to complicate some of the injury recovery and the injury from happening in the first place. Not always. But in work comp, it certainly is a multiplier. It's a complicator. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in claim reviews and been so frustrated at the pace of injury recovery. And it's usually because the employee has poor health. And if you show me an employee that has poor health and an injury, I'm going to show you a complicated injury recovery or one that's going to take longer. So we started teaching a lot with body mechanics and teach, you know, trying to make sure that people lifted right. And you know, if you lift with your legs straight, I can show you that there's two muscles that are primarily doing all of the load and all of the work in your low back compared to if you use proper body mechanics when you use 22 of the muscles in your legs and your abs and your, the back of your legs and your glutes. But 80% of the time, people have back pain at some point of their lives. And usually, it goes away on its own. 
don't have to be treated. I mean, you don't have to go in and have any type of epidural steroid injections. Now, there are really bad injuries that require medical intervention, but a lot of times back pain just heals itself on its own. The peak of back pain is age, as you lose around 34. Everybody thinks it's much higher, but as we get older, we get smarter about how we work. A lot of times we have to do less manual labor as we get um, older as well. People don't get stuck on a diagnosis. Um, a lot of times that they always say that, you know what, I know that the diagnosis is really what's caused my problem, but we can actually tell structurally that, you know what, what shows on your MRI impression may not be actually what's actually happening in your back. You could have a bulging disc at L4, L5, but your pain is at L2, L3, so there's just things that we always have to kind of back away from and try to make sure that they don't get too attached to that impression because, like I said, asymptomatic MRIs in this entire room, nine out of 10 of us are gonna come back with that abnormal impression. And you show that to a workers' compensation person, they say, that's it, I need to be fixed. Look at that impression. I have a bulging disc at L4, L5. I didn't have that before. They likely did. One study showed that approximately 1% of the time, the patient's diagnosis for the MRI was actually the cause of their back pain. So sometimes it's a danger doing imaging because people get so connected to that impression, even though it may have been there before the actual injury even occurred. So now this is kind of what our motto is for RMS. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in an earlier slide that I feel like I arrived here on the, on the shoulder of giants. And I know that's kind of a cliche and it's a little cheesy, but I really feel that way. From the early working with Bob Tarver at Ingalls and risk management to some of the work I did with some of the clients at that hospital, Indiana Harbor Belt Railroad, being out in their yard and modifying the switches and working under Bob Wolning. Bob Wolney called himself Checkbook Bob because he, all he felt was writing settlements for all the injuries that he had with the railroad. All those folks kind of shaped me. And even working with like Bob and, and Jeff over here um, from IPMG, and they have a lot of information about um, insurance that I pick up on. I'm a service guy. I look for services that we use to prosecute complex insurance problems on our client's behalf. That's why it's so important that we partner up with folks like Connell when we came to Missouri, I always want to know who is working with public entities, who's working with complex risks. We want to know so we can actually help them come up with solutions that will help their work comp insurance management. And that's really what this is about. So the more sophisticated access that you have to resources, the more that you're going to be able to develop your sophistication in managing your insurance. So now it's about developing and designing services and systems to prosecute those coverage threats. And work comp is one that we always feel is a threat, um, just because the medical can get so expensive. But I tell you, you know, what is a close second for us right now, and fortunately we're not having to cover this today, is our law enforcement liability work. Um, we're just under assault right now when it comes to the, our police officers that we work with, when it, whether it's workers' compensation or liability. Um, and we're going to talk to someone today about some of the things that are happening with law enforcement and workers' compensation. I have some videos in here that are pretty interesting, but they apply to almost all industries, you know, some of the things that we're going to be seeing. In them. Just hours from now, more than 100 former police officers, firefighters, and other city workers will be rounded up in a major fraud investigation. They're accused of milking the system and your tax dollars. Chief investigative reporter Jonathan Deans is live in the newsroom with the exclusive new details tonight. Jonathan. Chief, in all, we're told to expect 106 arrests tomorrow. But News 4 has learned there could be many more arrests in the weeks ahead as 300 other former city workers are facing scrutiny. The alleged benefit scheme involves mostly former police officers and firefighters. Officials tell us these rescue workers claimed that they became severely mentally disabled and were entitled to Social Security disability benefits, up to $50,000 a year in taxpayer benefits. But investigators say these former workers were lying, that they were not disabled and working other jobs, like a martial arts instructor, a helicopter pilot, and selling pastries in Little Italy. Many had claimed they were traumatized while washing to, rushing to help the day the towers fell, but investigators say many were nowhere near ground zero that day. 
Most of those to be arrested allegedly met with the same two lawyers. Those two lawyers, ages 89 and 83, allegedly helped to fill out bogus claims. In exchange, investigators say the two lawyers were paid kickbacks, secret cash payments made in paper bags on a park bench near their offices. Millions and millions of dollars was allegedly built from the Social Security Disability Program meant to help the truly needy. The Manhattan DA, NYPD Commissioner, Social Security, and Homeland Security investigators all expected to tell us much more about this case at a news conference tomorrow. We're count fraud. It's so frustrating. And every, everybody has a story about it. A lot of times we cast a, a suspicious eye on legitimate injuries. Technical problem? Miss Amy, I'm mean, detecting some impairment. Okay? Yeah, you're very lethargic in your answers. You, you don't know the address where you live at. Okay? Your failure to maintain a single lane of your increase in speed, your decrease in speed, your increase in speed. You want to do some field sobriety exercises for me? No, thank you. Step one, check. Eight or six officers just been hit by a vehicle. Suspect vehicle ran me over. So, watching that gets me. Either the first video we watched with the fraud gets me even more angrier. That guy had a legit injury, and all those other people are trying to build the system. It just it drives you nuts. So you have to have systems in place to make sure there's checks and balances to make it difficult for fraud to take place. Because otherwise, we become de deliberately indifferent almost to it taking place. And if we don't act on it, then it's going to continue to happen. Really, the work comp si uh, strategy that you have should be very simple. And just think about it you know, along this statement. What are the services, tools, and controls that you could have access to that can have a positive impact on your workers' compensation insurance? What do you have access to that can influence and shape your work comp? And if you don't think that you have access to sophistication or good resources and tools, don't let that stop you from going to the basics and fundamentals. And we're going to talk about the five key areas that you should focus on today. Okay. So one of the bigger things that is important for us is, is knowing who to work with and who knows markets really well, who knows work comp insurance. That's why when we came down here, it was so important that we met with Jeff, Aaron, and Tim. Uh, I've worked with Aaron. Is Aaron in here? There he is. I worked with Aaron when he was over uh, in the alternative risk space uh, on complex, really, insurance problems for work comp. Uh, we get into some of the finer details of scene management, scene engineering when it comes to public safety space, like for the fire and EMS when they do calls and things. A lot of times they're so well equipped, the fire districts that we work with, you know, really well funded, have great engineering controls, everything under the sun that you can imagine to do you know, proper patient handling and positioning and getting them into the rig and they still have back injuries. So you sit there and you say, why does that happen? How can that happen? So you start going in and saying, laying out all the patient handling apparatus in the bays, and we go over all the contraindications, the indications, when you use it, when you don't use it, from the scoop stretcher to the ked sled, the, they call them the whale sail, which is a big, it's the big tarp that they use to lift really big people. I mean, from the power cots, the power load, we go through everything. And they still have injuries. Think, why is that? How is that possible? So then we start doing the breakdown of what happens at the scene. And there's a real just absence of scene leadership, scene command, scene engineering, scene control. It's a leadership issue. And um, I challenged them. I said, well, "How come you guys don't have people that are specially trained just to do patient positioning and handling, getting them on their rig?" You know, when the military, when they have like an assault team that goes on, I mean, they have one guy that does the breaching. and He's the breacher. He carries a gun, but when they have to go in and they have to breach a door, they call the breacher. Not everybody's the breacher, just the breacher is. And I asked this particular chief, why can't we train people just to do patient handling, especially equip them and train them and make sure that they're fully capable, make them the product champions that I referred to earlier that we assigned in the long-term care facilities? Let's make product champions. 
These guys are the ones that do patient handling. So when the emergency response team goes, these guys do the patient handling. They're the ones that engineer it. They're the ones that grab all of the apparatus and they know which equipment should be used. They said, well, we think everybody should be trained on everything. And it's, he was just really indifferent to any type of suggestion. So there was a cultural issue that we were trying to unwind and get them to kind of connect with. And that's a challenge, because then you're getting into the leadership and some of the way that they manage their scene and how they manage their calls. That can be personal. So um, even though that you have great equipment and the best engineering controls, the cultural can unravel and unwind that stuff from being effective. I know Connell has a really good program for helping their members with some of the HR-centric stuff that are involved with reporting claims, making sure it goes to the carrier, the investigation, wage statements, everything that is required to really support the filing of a work comp claim. Um, I know Tim and Connell's team does an amazing job with that. Not every producer or broker is like that. Um, so you're fortunate, and I would encourage you to reach out to them because they have great solutions when it comes to workers' compensation and the complex problems that comes with that. So this is kind of what the work comp market space looks like in Missouri, to my understanding. Jeff, would you say this is a fair representation? So you have standard market options, which is like Liberty, Hartford, Travelers. Um, one thing the standard market likes is certainty. And the conditions that you probably are facing with the organizations that you work for is uncertainty when it comes to the standard market and how they assess a risk. Between COVID, um, the property, it's just a really, really crazy market right now. So th the second piece is you have options in alternative risk instruments and solutions. And those are pools and trust, and I know one is um, in Missouri here is MPR. We've worked with MPR. They're an amazing group uh, out of Kansas City. So that's an alternative risk option. And um, there's also self-insurance in there. And then finally, you have the assigned risk pool. And that's for the people that have really, really hard or risky business that the standard market and there's no pool solutions or options for them. Those three options offer very distinct and different services. Very different. In the standard market, with Liberty and Travelers and Hartford, they have such diversity of policyholders that it's hard for them to really specialize when it comes to some of the complex areas of insurance that really move the loss needle. Very, they have standardized work comp uh, services, um, a lot of safety-related checklists and things like that. And not that that's that bad. That can be effective, and you can fold those in as part of an effective work comp insurance management program. But really, you have to get into really why and where losses occur. And you have to have specialized services that you can actually access to make sure that you can prosecute those problems. And that's where you have usually better services or specialized services with alternative risk options or solutions, because pools a lot of times they're all made up of the single, same single thing, like in the Illinois, the pool that we work with in Illinois, it's all public entities. So all the services and systems that we are interested in helping them with are all public entity centric. And same thing, if you have a nursing home pool, same thing happens. A lot of the services are designed specifically just for nursing homes. With travelers, they have such diversity of policyholders, they can't get to that level of specificity or specialization. It's not a knock on them, it's just the fact. I mean, they would have to have so much funding for these specialized services that it would just be exhaustive for them to do. You have anything to add to that, Jeff? Okay. I put this up here because this is the presumption um, work comp issue that's going on for early responders right now. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this if you guys are a public entity. I'm not going to read through this slide. It is out there. I'm sure you've had to work with it or maybe have had to deal with this already. We're dealing with it in Illinois. Every state has a presumption issue around COVID now. Some of the national trends that are coming along are really, um, I think, impacting work comp right now. At least this is what we're seeing when we're traveling across the country. Um, I speak in a lot of different states in support of a lot of different pools and uh, large self-insureds. 
And a lot of the concerns that we're seeing with some of the reinsurance partners that we have right now is on the COVID uncertainty. Uh, we don't know what's going to be a claim or not around COVID right now, so there is some uncertainty with this. Across the nation, there is. Another one is comorbidity management or metabolic, metabolic health. Um, comorbidities are really just two or more disease or illnesses combined at the same time with somebody. So we got real interested in this stuff because we were finding that it had a huge impact on workers' compensation injury management. I told you earlier, how many times have we sat in claim reviews before and been frustrated at someone's injury recovery, only to find out that they have several comorbidities. They might be diabetic, they might have sleep apnea, they could be obese, they might have type of hypertension. Those things complicate injury management, injury recovery. My dad was, I think, oh gosh, he was in his mid-70s when he had to have a rotator cuff surgery. The man recovered in six months. If this would have been one of our workers in our program, it would have been two years. Just way, way different. Different motivation, um, different, different enabling. The other area that we are noticing more interest in, and we've had a lot of people ask us to look at this for them, is this Comorbidity management as it relates to metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is a group of five risk factors that are either going to result in diabetes, heart disease, or stroke. And those five risk factors are increased blood sugar, hypertension above 120 or 80. That's wrong. The AHA just changed it, I think, within the past 18 months. So they lowered it to 120 over 80, as anything above that is considered high blood pressure now or elevated. High blood sugar levels, insulin resistance, if you have high fasting blood sugar levels, that's an indicator of something metabolically going on. Excess fat around the waist, high triglyceride levels, low levels of good cholesterol or HDL. And then think about this, the complicating contribution of health and injury, recovery and injury management. What do those five things do if they're present at the same time of an injury, a work comp injury? Is that gonna complicate the claim? I promise you it is. And typically, work comp insurance isn't going to cover this stuff because it's not part of the injury. Workers' compensation insurance is only responsible for the injury. But my argument is this. How can we be only be interested in responding to the injury if all this other stuff is going to complicate the injury recovery in the first place? So we started getting really interested in maybe doing something with the health when it is influencing the injury recovery and injury management. Again, we don't have responsibility for this. And this is something the standard market is not going to give in when it comes to a solution or a service for their members because, again, they're just saying that this is our responsibility. That's the group health plan. So, I don't know, about five or six years ago, we came across, we were at a conference, and we came across some folks from the University of California systems. and. Um, they gave a seminar on a new program that they were um, administering to their injured employees. And really what it did is any employee that worked for the University of California system that had more than one work comp injury was eligible for these services. So really what they were doing is they were trying to go after the repeater injuries because repeaters cost so much money. So this is what happened. So overall, after they went through the Work Strong program, the claims were 56% low, below what their expected losses were. And this was just administering services, basic fundamental services in nutrition and fitness for their injured employees that had more than one work comp injury. So this was compelling to me because I'm sitting here thinking as a clinician, I said, man, that's that's something to poke around on. So their costs were 1.5 million less. It's a three-year program to improve health and fitness. Uh, they provide resources in fundamental nutrition and fitness, what they call functional fitness, but it's not true functional fitness. Theirs is really just general fitness. And then they provide resources in things like nicotine cessation and things like that as well. Saw no subsequent work comp claims in the three-year follow-up. That's remarkable. All these people were having sub, you know, multiple work comp claims, and then they go through this program and it stops them from having 
you know, losses going forward. That, that to me was just really, really interesting. So this all comes full circle because if you think about what's happening in America right now with, I, I, you could almost call it the supersizing of America. There's, a, there's an epidemic in America that we're getting larger. I mean, you could argue that the food companies are poisoning us, us from within. And it's changing the conditions that we have to operate in to support some of the clients that we serve, like this. Pay particular attention to how many people are involved in this operation. Also pay attention to the rigging involved that they're setting up. There's our fire chiefs in here. We have fire, a couple fire chiefs in here. My father was a volunteer paramedic uh, for the town that we grew up in. He was a business manager in a school district, so the school district allowed him to make calls throughout the day, you know, when there was emergencies in town. And I asked my dad, you know, how often did you have to respond to someone that was over 400 pounds? And he thought, he says, I don't know if we ever did. It's a routine week now for our fire departments and EMS. 400 pounds is manageable to these guys now. This is a man that weighs 900 pounds. This is the rigging, engineering, the manpower, special equipment that they had to bring to prosecute this problem. Now, if I go in there and tell these fire in the paramedics that lift with your legs? What are they going to tell me? Clearly it demonstrates I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Lift with your legs with this? I look at that, that tape of the firemen and the police fraud in New York, and then you see guys doing this, and you know that they're going to have an injury because of it. It's a flat, that's a flatbed tow truck. Just the rigging and the engineering alone was just, I, I was stunned.
poor guy wiping his head. I mean, it's, they're taking this man out through a window, too. I couldn't get him through that door. All the fire folks that we work with, the parks that we work with, they have frequent flyers. They know which people are going to call for lift assist and things like that. We do outreach. We do any type of social outreach to try to make sure that we can change the behaviors that are contributing to that. We went to a large nursing home one time in Chicago, multi-floor, and they had an obesity wing. They had the thing on the top floor. It's just, why would you have that up on the top floor? We asked them to re-engineer because the fire department was having to go up there. Couldn't get the stretcher and the rig in the, in the elevator, so they'd take them down the stairs. It was just it was a disaster. So when we talk about complex insurance problems, this is a complex insurance problem. We didn't count the, the people, and there were 18 people involved in this. I think there could have been more, but we didn't want to count them twice. I don't know what the emergency was. What do you want? Even if it was life, life threatening, they couldn't go any faster. So when Bob Tarver asked us to do a lift team for the hospital, I don't think he had this in mind. This is two mega boards they're using, not one, two. Two that are strapped together. That's the truck winch that's pulling it down. liability the fire department takes on because of this I mean I believe this is the guy that sued the department because they transported him on an open um, flatbed he says it was a not, it wasn't it, it was like an assault on his dignity because he was because he was transported on the on the back of a flatbed truck Now, we do a lot with striker for power lock cots and power loads. <laughs> That's, there's nothing that they have as an engineering solution that could help them. These guys did an amazing job with this gentleman. Absolutely amazing. I kind of found it kind of amusing, too. This guy has a back belt on. I don't know what that's going to do. <laughs> anyway, it's a 900-pound man. So this is the obesity map in 2015. I only went up to 2018, I think. But you can pay attention to you know, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi. This is 2016, 2017. You can see the change between 2006 and 2017. I mean, look at Mississippi. What's, why down here? What's going on down here? Why is there more obesity, you think? It's deep fried foods. You could deep fry my projector and I think it would be good to eat. So that's, that's probably what's happening. We need to take a break. So I'm going to introduce you to Jeff Weber. Jeff is our executive vice president and uh, he is the leader of our company. And Jeff and Bob, Bob Spring in the back, Bob is also part of IPMG and they're involved with us going in other states and helping other pools, 
other large self-insureds, with the suite of services that we have available to members and clients to help them with their complex and most complicated, complicated insurance problems. So Jeff's just going to explain a little bit about IPMG and what we do besides some of the stuff that I've been talking about today because I get so service oriented and so focused in the area that I can have blinders sometimes and I can detune some of the market things that are happening with insurance and that's why Jeff and Bob are so important when we go on these endeavors together. Thank, thanks, Brian. Uh, first, I just want to thank you know, Connell Insurance for putting this on. I can tell you I work with agents all across the Midwest and all across the nation and there's very few that go through the effort to put on things like this for their clients and even prospective clients. So uh, this is truly tremendous. And also for you folks, thank you all for coming. I know everyone's busy, uh, especially during these times, but this turnout is great. And it really shows that you folks you know, are committed to your public entities, to your businesses, to learn more and make them better. So again, this is a tremendous turnout. Everyone's busy and I know it takes a lot to get here. So. Thank you for being here. Uh, real quick, this, you know, a Silver Dollar City story that Jeff was talking about. Uh, my family's down in Arkansas. I'm in St. Louis, so been to Silver Dollar City a lot, but just how times have changed. I remember going to Silver Dollar City when I was about 12, and they had the muskets, that you could shoot a musket at Silver Dollar City, a 12-year-old. And you went and you shot the musket. There's no way they would let you do that today. So that tells you how times have changed. But you could shoot a musket rifle at Silver Dollar City. So Brian's like, no way. But it was true. So, but again, I don't think they let you do that anymore. So, <laughs> uh, but just real quick, I'll just give you a little bit of background on IPMG so you understand where we're coming from and how we handle business. So we handle all aspects of insurance, uh, from the insurance placement so we go out and we find different carriers the best fit for our clients. And then we handle all the services. And I know, you know, workers' compensation gets a bad rap, but just a little bit about our philosophy on workers' compensation and as we handle claims, is, as Brian has alluded to, is that, you know, 90% of workers' compensation claims are legitimate, right? And so when we get claims in, and this is just some information for you folks to take back to your entities and your businesses, is that, so when a claim comes in, most claims adjusters are gonna treat that as a legitimate claim. Uh, because what is the purpose of workers' compensation? It was put on the books to make sure that your injured employees that got hurt at work get the best treatment, get the best medical, and get them back to work as soon as possible in a healthy way. But if you think something is fraudulent, if you think something is not correct, you have to let your agent know you should let your company know that, hey, we don't think this is legitimate, right? We think there's a red flag. You know, we heard that he's going water skiing on the lake. Uh, we, he's roofing houses. So you, because if you don't, and everything looks good when the claim comes in, that claims adjuster is gonna treat it as a legitimate claim because that's what they wanna do. So keep that in mind. You have to communicate with your agent, with your, with your company about what you know and what you hear. Um, Again, because the majority of workers' compensation claims are accurate. Now, it doesn't mean that if you think something's fraudulent or if you know this person's trying to milk the system that we can stop it. Sometimes you can't just because of the way the law works. But just keep that in back of your, your mind. And our philosophy on claims and what Brian's even going to get more into is there's two things you can do to help prevent workers' compensation claims. One is preventative up front, right? The training the seminars, the, you know, teaching your employees to be safe, get that safety mentality. And the second part is after the claim has happened, right? How do we get that employee back to work? How do we get his treatment? And a lot of times employees, when they get hurt, and we go to them, we say, hey, we want you to use this doctor because he's the best and you're gonna have one surgery and be done. Sometimes employees are skeptic because they see the ads on the TV from the lawyer saying, hire us, don't trust an insurance company. And at least for IPMG, that's not true. We want to get this person back to work because we want this claim as low as possible. The big thing is we don't want them sitting at home, right? We want them to get back to work. And most employees want to come back to work. So you need to think about, you know, light duty return to work programs, things like that. Talk to your employees that we care about. You get them back to work as soon as possible because that is the best way for their mental health and their physical health also. And then... All the work comp claims will just come along with it in terms of lowering that. Because keep in mind, 
the lower your work comp claims, the lower your insurance premium. So that's, you know, that's some key things there. But in terms of what, you know, that's our philosophy at IPMG, that we want to treat the claims that are legitimate, get those treated, get them treated the right, right way, get this person back to healthy so they can get back to work. Not only for our customers, but for the employee. So there's a lot of negativity, that, like I said, in terms of when an employee gets hurt, they think, oh, they're just, they want me to come back to work because, you know, they don't care about me. No, the best help for them is to get them back to work. And they see the lawyer ad saying, hey, come, you know, get an attorney. It's fine if they get an attorney. But let's just make sure that they don't see us as the enemy. Because we're not. Again, if it's a legitimate one. But we're also out to look out for your best interest also. So if it is a fraudulent claim, or we do have an employee that's looking to milk the system, we want to make sure that we do our job so that doesn't happen. So that you folks don't get dinged any more than what you should. I mean, because again, injuries happen. That's why every state has a work, most states have workers' compensation laws, because we want to make sure that those employees are taken care of. You know, but again, there are fraudulent claims. There's a reason why we see a spike in workers' compensation claims when? Deer hunting season, deer season. So, and you have to be aware of those things. But again, if you think something's fraudulent and you're not letting your agent know or the company know and everything looks good on paper, then we don't know. And again, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you tell us, hey, this is fraudulent, he's out skiing. does not mean that that claim is going to go away or that we can stop the workers' compensation claim. But at least it puts a red flag, right? And what Brian and his team does, they look at all that information and they can put together a strategy for you in terms of safety, in terms of not just like Brian would say, not just like, oh, we're going to teach you how to lift, right? You have to look at your losses. If you're not having any back claims, doesn't mean you shouldn't do back training, but you're having a ton of eye injuries, well, maybe you should start with your eye injuries, right? So that is the key. That's what we look like. We don't take a shotgun approach. We take more of a sniper approach. And that's what you should be doing in terms of your public entities and your businesses, really looking at your losses, looking at your near incidents, and seeing where you can have the most impact. Look at things in like the pre-incident, which is prevention, and then post-incidents, which is response. What are the services, what levers do you have access to that you can pull or fold in that can either prevent an injury from happening, and if it does happen, that you can respond to it and manage it accordingly? We're going to talk about a few of those things here. Um, and just the last thing to keep in mind, again, you know, communicate with your employee, especially when they have that injury, right? Reach out to them. Make sure you're communicating. Don't, you know, make them feel like a pariah because they filed a workers' compensation claim. Just keep in mind, the better your work comp claims are, the better job Connell Insurance can do about placing your insurance. If your work comp losses are good, they're going to have a lot more companies to be able to get quotes from to get you the best rates. When your workers' compensation losses go up, it eliminates a lot of companies. So rather than getting six companies interested in giving you premiums, you might only have two. So keep in mind, it all comes, it all evolves around that. But again, workers' compensation is here to protect the employees. And we should do that. You know, that is our job, right? So again, we want to make sure that those legitimate injuries are handled in an efficient way, get them treated the way they do, get them back to healthy, but also being conscious of the ones that are not legitimate or fraudulent and making sure that those ones are fought and making sure that those folks are not milking the system, making sure those folks aren't sitting at home when they're able to come back to work. Um, O'Brien has got into a lot, but you know, we're looking to prevent the second and third injuries. And uh, Brian probably doesn't have this chart, but he can tell you is that when those folks have their second and third work comp injuries, those amounts start to go up by 50% each time. So that's what we're looking to prevent is those second, third injuries either by looking at what happened with that injury. You need to look at the injuries and say, okay, he tried to lift 100 pounds. Well, he knows better. We need to do more education in that area. Or he jumped out of the truck, you know, and he twisted his knee. Okay. And it might sound silly, but we do training on how to get out of a truck. And it sounds like, well, everyone should know how to get out of a truck, and I do it. Sometimes you don't. You're in, you get in a hurry and you jump out. You know, our police officers... You know, 
when they're in a hot pursuit, you can't tell them, well, before you chase this guy, make sure you stretch. So there's some things you can't prevent. But again, those are the ones that we're here to do. So that's this one thing, you know, take back your employees is, you know, if you get hurt, yeah, let's, take, let's get workers' compensation, let's take care of you, and let's get you treated the right way. We, you know, workers' compensation uh, claims is not the enemy for these folks. Our claims adjusters care about the employees, and they want to get them back to work. So There's sensitivity. There's financial sensitivity for you folks, too, in managing lost time. I mean, the replacement cost of having someone fill that staffing absence and then all the lost time benefits that are associated with having a work comp claim. I know that we've all probably had frustrations with um, <clears throat> some of the hires that we have, or we've made hires and people, as they get older, you know, they decondition in place. Um, we have some police officers that were hired by their departments, and they were five foot 10 and 175 pounds and fit like Marines. Over the course of a 20-year career, they average five pounds of weight gain a year, and all of a sudden they're 5'10 and 350 pounds, and they're unable to do their job. But organizations never held them accountable for meeting a fitness standard. Does that sound familiar? Have you seen people that are working at a department, you think, boy, doesn't, how, how are they able to physically do their job? Well, take a look at these couple videos officer was physically unfit for duty. The city of Bellevue says the tapes make the case against former officer Christopher Parent. Good evening. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Julie Cornell. One day after a commission agreed Parent should be fired, police training tapes are made public. They're the tapes a civil service commission viewed before agreeing the Bellevue police officer did not meet physical conditioning standards. I-Team investigator Suzanne Dale reports our big story at 6. This video was supplied to KETV Newswatch 7 by the city of Bellevue. Here, Officer Christopher Parent is participating in a firearms testing exercise. This shoot was explained and demonstrated by a, a firearms instructor. Parent gets out of the car, draws his weapon, and begins to shoot. Here's the second position. You have to kneel down, you shoot, and then you have to get up. Captain Herb Evers with the Bellevue Police Department tells me the gun must be pointed downrange at the target during the entire exercise. He's struggling trying to get up off the ground. His gun is all over the place. And here, Parent is unable to get up from a kneeling position. He tries several times and can't get up without using his arm for support. After resting, Parent is able to get up on the second attempt. Christopher Parent's attorney says Parent performed two other tasks. He was able to pick up a baby from the floor and using tactical moves was able to take down another officer acting as a suspect. Stop, 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 stop. On the second try, Parent is able to get the officer up. Captain Herb Evers says this type of performance is simply unsafe. My number one concern was for Chris Parent. I've known Chris Parent for 25 years and um, a lot of respect for Chris Parent as a person, and that's not what this is about. I'm not trying to embarrass Chris Parent. Parent was fired last November under a Bellevue police policy requiring officers to be physically fit. After hearings last week, the Bellevue Public Service Commission on Monday ruled Parent was physically unfit for duty. We cannot expect a person that type of physical condition to protect and serve the public. With more complete coverage, Suzanne Deo, KETV, Newswatch 7. Christopher Parent's attorney, Steve Delaney, tells Suzanne Parent was dieting and losing weight when he had a field training officer with him. Parent does not feel he's a danger to himself or others. Delaney says Christopher Parent has had a number of surgeries on his knees. This is the only job Parent has performed during his adult life, and he loves being a police officer. Delaney tells Suzanne that Parent will now appeal the firing to the Sarpy County District Court. We want to know what you think. Was Officer Parent treated fairly? We have a discussion underway on our website. You'll find a link on our homepage. Just go to KETV.com. Was Christopher Parent <coughs> treated fairly? It's a tough question, I think. Who failed who there? When did, that, when did Christopher Parent go from being physically capable of doing the job to incapable of doing the job? And was the department deliberately indifferent by not acting on it when that happened? Because you know what they just did right there? 
letting him operate that way, under the ADA, they made reasonable accommodations. They can't hold him accountable now to a fitness standard. He's been working that way for how many years, and they let it happen. Complicated insurance problems. That's what this stuff is. And <clears throat> this is not an indictment on Christopher Parent, and um, God rest his soul, I think he passed away within the past 18 or 24 months. Um, but I look at the agency there, and, and I say this. If Christopher Parent's crossing a street, and he's about to be lit up by a car, you can bet every one of their command staff would have tried to stop him from being injured, right? They had the same opportunity as he was getting larger and larger and larger and unable to do the job to inter do intervention, and they didn't do it. They're deliberately indifferent to his condition, and now they have to accept that he can work in that capacity because they didn't act on it earlier. This training video cost an overweight Bellevue police officer his job. But Chris Parent is back on the force and ready to prove himself. Tonight, he's talking with KETV Newswatch 7 first about a tough two years. No income? Your name drugs or dirt? How would it be for you? Good evening, I'm Brandi Peterson. I'm Rob McCartney. It was a controversial decision that went to the courts. Should a police officer's weight determine if he's fit for duty? KETV News Watch 7's Farah Fazal spoke with Chris Parent tonight. She's live with the exclusive interview in tonight's big story. Farah? Officer Parent could be back in uniform and in a police cruiser in a few days. He's won every legal battle to get his job back. He has to pass one more mandatory gun test before he's closer to wearing his badge. Officer Chris Parent walked into the Bellevue Police Department for the first time in almost two years. Officer Parent came to start the process to get back into uniform. Last week, he cleared the final legal hurdle to get his job back. But you've won your case now. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. Are you happy you're back? The Bellevue police chief fired Officer Parent in August of 2007 because of his performance at this state-mandated gun test. Bellevue police gave us this video. Officer Parent passed when he had to shoot and hit his target, but he failed when he had to kneel down, shoot and get up. He eventually used his arms. Parent won his job back because Bellevue's officer wellness policy was conflicting and it said officers only had to be in fair shape. The department revised that policy. Officer Parent uh, was on the road patrol at the time of his termination. He will be reinstated to the road patrol. Bellevue City Attorney Mike Polk says Parent should be back on patrol as soon as he passes this test again. Do you think you're physically able to? Did it for 30 years. In the condition uh, that you are now? Yeah. Officer Parent says it has been a long, hard two years. No income? Your name drugs or dirt? How would it be for you? He says he loves his job, but he says it won't be easy to go back to work. It was a hostile work environment when I left. Because of your weight? Nope. Oh, it's not over. What do you mean? Trust me. You're back on the force. You've got your job back. Chief won't let it go. Now, Officer Parent wouldn't tell me anything more about the hostile work environment he expects to go back to. The Bellevue Police Chief is on vacation. Officers told us to talk to the city attorney. Officer Parent won't have to pass a physical test because the union contract says there is no physical requirement for existing officers. If he fails the mandatory gun test, he could be suspended or fired. Brandy. Farah Fazal reporting live. Thanks, Farah. So that, was, that was the result. Chris Parent went back to work. Now, <clears throat> there was an intervention that the department could have done if they went about it the right way. If they had an essential functions testing program in place where a department head or supervisor, someone in leadership position, a command staff, noticed that he was physically incapable of doing parts of his job. It could be him walking in with a limp. Now, as part of the policy, you can request Chris to go through a fitness for duty test, essential functions testing. And if he comes back and he demonstrates that he can't do some of the essential demands of the job, you can sit down and have a reasonable accommodation discussion with Chris. 
You can put him on a personal improvement plan to try to make sure that he can improve those tolerances which he failed at during the essential functions testing. You can give him a remedy period of six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever the agency or the department puts into the policy. If he fails after the six, nine, or 12 months, you can do an extension. Now, if he fails after an extension and he still demonstrates that he doesn't have the fitness or duty to do the essential demands of the job, then you can do a separation agreement. But this all has to be mapped out in the policies. So the more sophisticated an agency or department has in controlling some of the pre-incident and the post-incident injury management systems, stuff like that with Chris Parent wouldn't happen. Again, this is not an indictment on Chris Parent. I think that the department and several leadership positions failed Chris Parent. He definitely had some failings too. I mean, he had behavioral decisions that were happening that you know, caused him to, have, to be that size. But there are systems and services that you can match to try to get him back on track. Otherwise, I mean, the liability is just huge, not only from employment practice, discriminatory firing, just from a work comp perspective alone. It's a risk for Chris Parent. It's a risk for the other officers of the department as well. Now, this resonated with me. Um, and is Bob in here still? Bob Spring? Oh, no, I'm wrong Bob. <laughs> so Bob Spring from IPMG. Um, we worked on an account, and Jeff knows this account too. And uh, we had a sheriff's officer that was 450 uh, plus pounds. And he had seven work comp injuries, um, metabolic syndrome, just was a health risk. I mean, just a catastrophic uh, risk. So he hit our triggering system. And we use a triggering system to administer some of our post, um, our response services post-incident. And one of those services is enhanced case management. And I mentioned this earlier before. And what we do is we use a triggering system when a work comp injury happens. And we look for if a person has two or more comorbidities, if they're on opioids for more than seven days, if they have more than five days of lost time, and if they have two or more work comp injuries. When those triggers are identified, that gets sent to case management. And we look and see if we can do any type of intervention to try to see if we can improve the health. Because I told you earlier, how many times have we sat in claim reviews and been frustrated by the injury recovery, the pace of injury recovery, only to find out that there's a lot of health issues that are complicating that injury recovery. We felt that we could no longer sit on the sidelines and operate and have that health complicate the injury recovery without us having some type of meaningful way to shape or influence that. So um, I mentioned the University of California systems. We did one, a few steps further than what they do. They have the luxury of all of their employees are, you know, are all of their workers are employees of the University of California system, including the doctors, so they can force them or make them go to their own university system clinics. Um, we don't have that luxury. So um, we had to use a different system that put them into case management, we can make sure that we can assign a doctor or a doctor that works for us, um, Dr. Kim Gaston. Some of the folks in here may have been at some of her session and my sessions um, before we've been down in Branson and we spoke for NPR in the past. And um, <clears throat> she gets a hold of them and she administers a physician-based weight loss program, a nutritional program. She puts them on a functional fitness program. Functional fitness, not fitness, functional fitness. Functional fitness is fitness that's involved in everyday living that you do, squatting down on the floor, getting up off the floor, things that are important to making sure that we can do things like running and climbing stairs. And Kim is amazing at rewiring and remapping a person's personal health, and it improves the chances that they have better injury recovery, and the timelines are condensed. So we thought, how much is it going to cost us to administer something like this? And I thought, it's pretty nominal. So we thought we could get it done in under $5,000. We're averaging around $2,500 per claim. But we've had $60,000 reserve takedowns. We've had people go back to work where they said they were never going to be able to. We've had perm totals get reclassified that they go back to work. We have police officers that were supposed to have knee surgery. They drop the weight, and all of a sudden, they don't have to have the knee surgery anymore had rotator cuffs that were planned for surgery. Dr. Kim got a hold of them. 
she, they lose weight. The anatomical remodeling is redefined, I guess, or remodeled. Because if you have a person that has a lot of body weight and adipose tissue, it actually remodels the geometry of the joint, especially in the shoulder, which is a, you know, it's a free-floating joint. It's a triaxial moving joint. It doesn't have the ball and socket um, connecting like the hip does. So if you actually drop, if you add a lot of weight to a person in the upper body, it can actually remodel the geometry of how the shoulder works. So when Dr. Kim was able to drop the weight off the person, their shoulder geometry started working again. They went through a normal physical therapy program of about eight weeks. They didn't have to have the rotator cuff surgery. Remarkable. Just remarkable. So when you think about pre-incident services, that's injury prevention, making sure that you try to stop the injury from happening. Do not be indifferent to a person's health. Um, I do a lot of speaking for law enforcement groups across the country. And it's usually steeped in liability and constitutional law. And I find that stuff fascinating. But, you know, I'm up there with lawyers and, you know, Karen Bloom, who trains every um, federal judge in America. And I'm coming in after her. And I, I tell the, the audience, I said, what they just talked about is the easy stuff. That's constitutional law. I mean, the precedent's already set. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the toughest stuff that you're going to probably face over the course of the next year. Personal health and having conversations with your employees about it. No one's necessarily equipped to have those conversations. In fact, most people think that it's, it's off, you know, it's kind of out of bounds, and it's not. I mean, there's a certain intersection of personal health and personal performance and, and work productivity. It's just the way it is. I mean, I'd like to think that I could be an MBA center, but I don't have the height. So I don't have the physical capabilities to be an MBA center. I said earlier, you know, military has the breacher. I challenged the chief. I said, why can't we have patient handlers? Why can't you define that? Why can't you specialize that? If all the injuries are coming from patient handling, why wouldn't you get to that level of special, spec, uh, specificity or specialization? I mentioned this earlier because Aaron and I had talked about this. Um, and this is some of the complex things that we get into the culture. I mean, I mentioned earlier we had a fire protection district. One of the most well-funded districts I've worked with. Um, and they had every patient handling apparatus that you could possibly imagine, and still having constant waves of back injuries. So this group is in Illinois. And when a police officer or a firefighter or EMS or corrections officer gets hurt in the line of duty, they get 100% of their salary tax-free for one year. So there's a perverse incentive for these guys to have an injury and, not, and try not to go back to work. That's how it works in Illinois, so we try to make sure that we have systems in place that we can get people and keep them working, that you can keep them engaged. You have pre-incident services that you can manage that are prevention-based, but you also have response services that actually you can fold in that captures the people that are really unhealthy that can really cause you to have bad losses. Workers' compensation really pays for, I don't know, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide, but it really pays for benefits um, in three different ways. It does it for medical, temporary lost time, or it does it and identifies um, permanency. And permanency is based on specific loss, so you have a body part that's injured, and that's a certain percentage of your body, and then they, f they figure out what the, what the loss is. The five key components of work comp that I want you guys to take away or think about um, coming back and putting in place or thinking about building out for sophistication and improving some of your insurance management is what we're going to talk about right now. And the first one is hiring. Um, boy, back when I was at Diamond, uh, a gentleman named Bill Strong, I told you I arrived here on the shoulders of giants, and Bill Strong was one of them. He was the first claim manager I ever worked with. And we were in a claim review, uh, very contested with a large hospital group, and um, their director of risk management was just a bulldog on us. And she was up one side of us and down the other about why we were accepting these claims. And these claims were fraudulent. And it's, even though we have them on video, that they slipped and fell, that they believe that they're milking the system. And how could you ever accept and pay these claims? And finally, our claim manager, Bill, sat back in his chair. And he said, ma'am, he says, I'm sorry, but he said, your bad hire just became our bad work comp problem. And it stopped her in her tracks because he was right. We do a lot with integrity testing and push that with our members. 
this isn't something that you're going to see maybe a benefit for for maybe three to five years before you know a work comp claim may hit. But if you have people go through integrity testing, it's EEOC supported. You know, we pay for it for our clients. It can shape and give you decision support on making hiring decisions. They self-identify where they have areas of dishonesty, drug use, theft. It's, I think administered in 20 different languages. It's all online. It's nominal price, but it really helps our members with decision making around hiring. So they're not bringing in people that have a sense of entitlement that's going to become a work comp problem. Remember what Bill Strong t told me. Your bad hire became our bad work comp problem. Well, he didn't tell it to me. He told it to Ronnie Klein, who was the risk manager that we were working with. So think about that. Your bad hire will become your bad work comp problem or your bad liability problem, like this. Pay attention to the car that's coming up. That's a police officer on there. That's a police officer that has a closed head injury. He's in the hospital for 34 days. Now, Who's the bad hire here, the driver or the guy that's on the hood? It should never happen. I mean, the hiring of what you bring on to your agency is going to directly influence the insurance and how you, the activity that you have in insurance, particularly work comp, but also employment practice, liability. The second piece of this is injury prevention. This is probably the area that we have the most depth in because of the clinicians that we have on staff. My background's in physical therapy. Like I said, I was a therapist for five years. My wife is a physical therapist. She is a director of risk management for a healthcare loss control. I mean, you can imagine what our dinners are like. So we kind of live this stuff. We believe in injury prevention. Um, it's really what kind of got me out of physical therapy. I was more successful preventing injuries than I was in treating them. Quite frankly, I didn't care that people hurt. They came in and said, I hurt, I hurt. I said, shit, we all do. So you know what, get on the mat and exercise. I just wasn't that compassionate of a therapist. So I was way better in the injury prevention space because that's where the action was, and it's, I thought we were more effective that way. But your injury prevention, Jeff mentioned this earlier, make it data matched. You know, I mean, look at where your losses are. You know, we, we get it down to body part. We get it down to time of day, shift, I mean, time of year. We told one sheriff, you said, you want to make your back injuries go away? At, have what, half your shift do 12 hours one week, the other half do 12 hours the other week, and then let these guys off for deer season. I promise you it would impact his injury rates. He wouldn't do it, but we know that it would have been effective. But injury prevention is the things like back school and making sure that you have engineering controls to the high-risk areas that you have operations. And you do have those for your organization. I don't care if it's manufacturing, construction, public entity, if it is police, fire, EMS, all have their areas of risk. And all have their areas of opportunity to have better management so those risks don't produce losses. A lot of you folks are local taxing bodies, and my dad was a business manager for a school district, and he used to get insane if they had someone that was injured and they had to pay lost time on it. He said, how come I'm, up, I'm paying somebody for not having any type of work product or productivity? He used to get insane. This sensitivity with taxpayer funded you know, dollars. So this stuff is, really makes a difference to your local communities and how you pay for some of the insurance that you have to provide. The three things that we always look for in injury prevention is policy, training, and engineering. And we do a lot of surveillance. Our surveillance is based on really three key areas. It is our surveillance efforts on site. So we will go on site and look for areas that contribute or it could be what we call silent risk that a client may become desensitized to. And I say this um, because when I worked at the hospital, um, I was the head of the industrial medicine department, so I had to go to department head meetings every Monday. And one Monday I was going to department head meeting. I had just got done doing bedside treatments. I did get you know, five done before we went um, to the meeting. And um, there was a spilled styrofoam cup of water in the hallway. The hallway that I was walking in is it goes under a road because this hospital is huge. So we had to go under a road to get to the main hospital. And in this, in this um, tunnel was a spilled cup of water. I had my lab coat on and I carry paper towels in my lab coat because you just never know what type of you know, scene or environment that you're going to walk into in a patient's room. And I noticed the cup and I bent over and I cleaned it up and 
threw it in the waste can, walked to 20 feet um, to turn to go up the elevators, and the vice president of the hospital and the director of risk management, Bob Tarver, was standing there. They had staged the cuff of spilled water to see how many employees would walk by and not address it. Thank God I did it because they announced the number of employees from the department that did not address that and were inattentive to it. And I had five, because it was right outside my department. Those five employees were in my, my office the very next day. And I just told them this, I said, you know, what if it was your mom and dad that came in and it hit that spill, and you knew someone was inattentive and didn't address it? What would you do? How would you feel? You'd be pissed as hell. I would be. So we're all stewards of safety. And I mentioned this earlier, you know, when you see someone about to be, you know, crossing a street or a kid that's crossing a street and there's a car coming, we're compassionate people. We're going to try to stop that person from being hit or having some type of accident. You have the same opportunity when you see someone doing something unsafe. If you see someone that looks like they're unhealthy, they're wheezing and heaving when they're walking, those are all intervention opportunities that we have that can not only shape the needle for losses for you, you know what, it's the compassion, it's the right thing to do for us as well. So when we do this, this survey, we look at the data, and that's losses. We match it up by body type or body part, um, type of injury, location of the injury, what was happening. And then we want to try to develop policy and training that can either engineer out or procedure out some of the risks that contributed to that loss. This is not rocket science. It's really, really easy. It seems complicated, but it's not. It just takes some attention and actually looking at several layers of data and then making sure you have the surveillance opportunities on site that you can respond to. And by surveillance, I, I mean like, you know, if you see something that you know is unsafe, you have to bring it to someone's attention. And we become desensitized to risk when risk doesn't produce something. You know, why do we break the speed limit? not because we're trying to get someplace faster. I mean, I know that's, that's the common excuse, but why do we break the speed limit? You can get away with it. Every time you do, you don't get negative reinforcement for it. There's no ticket, there's no accident. But if you knew that every time you put your hand on a hot stove, it gets burned, and the same thing would happen with speeding, no one would do it. If you knew that by breaking the speed limit by, speed limit by one mile per hour, would get you a ticket every time, you never would do it. If kids knew that drinking and driving would either, you know, it would either be jail time or they would lose their license forever, they would never do it. But we become desensitized to risk when risk doesn't produce anything. And we become desensitized to risk, especially in environments that are very familiar to us. You know, you walk by a trip hazard 15 times and it doesn't trip until we have the oh shit moment pardon my friends, the oh crap moment, and then we say, why didn't anybody address this? So policy training and engineering. What policy can you develop? What do you have to train on for the policy? And what engineering controls can you apply and fold into that? That will have a definitive impact on what your losses are, especially where you have high trend lines. So the next one is triage response. <clears throat> And this is really important, and I, I've taken a lot more interest in triage than I ever did in the past, in the past five years mainly. And it's when I started understanding that probably about 30% of all frequency for work comp can be self-treated. And by self-treated, I mean they can actually self-treat with rest and ice. You don't even need to end up in the medical networks or any type of medical facilities, about 30%. So we started partnering with some uh, triage companies that help our supervisors and managers with decision support on when they should send someone to medical and when they can self-treat. But it's not just sending someone to medical, it's getting them to the right medical. First one, self-care. Second one, normal business hours for a physician. Third, immediate care. Fourth, emergency. So our nurses take calls, and we have an 800 number that our members call in with the injured worker, and they walk through an algorithm to figure out where they should land on the referrals for medical services. And we're able to keep a lot of people out of ERs. You know why? Because a supervisor or department head, in the absence of knowing, is going to do what? Send them to ER. We had a sheriff who says, Every one of my deputies needs to go to ER because that's the best level of care and the highest level of care that they're going to get. 
I said, well, you, I think you're just, you're mismanaging the healthcare system by doing that. I mean, not, every, not every injury, I mean, a small injury needs to go to ER. Like small injuries, a small knee tweak was going to ER. You can imagine what that did to the, the losses and how that impacted losses and put pressure on losses. So make sure you have adequate triage programs or systems or that you can access to give you decision support to make sure you know when an employee should land either in a physician's care, you know, normal hours, immediate care, or emergency, and God forbid, ambulance. If it's someone has an amputation, they shouldn't be calling our triage you know, line, they should be calling the ER. So there is some common sense with this. But this has allowed us to really have an impact where we had so much frustration where our members were falling into doctors that were bad doctors. The one pool that we work with, a large pool in Illinois, um, in Illinois you can't direct. You can't direct medical. So they're at a really big disadvantage. You can steer, you can channel, but it's a lot bigger challenge. You can direct medical in Missouri, which is a lot easier. The fourth one is claim reporting and incident investigation. Um, I can tell you that probably all of you in here do this very differently, and there's various levels of completeness and sophistication if we were to do an audit of everybody's claim reporting and claim an incident um, when you turn it into the um, insurance company. You really should work with your work comp insurance provider to make sure you understand their requirements. It's usually pretty standard and universal. But there are some things that you have to make sure that you include that are very carrier or program specific. So I would recommend that you make sure that you talk to the Connell folks and you talk to the insurance coverage that you have for work comp and understand what their requirements are. There are certain state requirements that you have to do too to fill out a work comp claim. Sometimes the carrier will turn that in on your behalf. Sometimes you have to turn it in on your behalf. So it's important you know which side of the fence that you lie there. But this is one of the areas that we, we do more work in than I want to. Um, I can tell you that I am not a good incident investigator. Um, we have some clinicians on my staff that are phenomenal, and they are the guys that I turn to and punt to to do this when we're asked and to do the training. Um, it is high-level technical and very detailed-oriented, um, and it just it doesn't fit with my brain. So um, Mark Bell, who is amazing, and he's actually a consultant that works for us. He's also a PT as well. He does a lot of the uh, assistance for us with our members and our clients to improve their sophistication with claim and incident reporting and the investigation that is required as part of that. So it's another area that you should definitely have um, a build out for your services to make sure that you can constantly improve the sophistication. Because if you don't do it the right way, the insurance company is going to call you back and start requesting for the, the information anyway. So do it as much and fill it out as much as possible that you can and get it off your desk and don't have to deal with the insurance, you know, second, third, fourth time around. And finally, the fifth one is return to work management. Um, <clears throat> Organizations that don't follow a return to work program are at a disadvantage when it comes to loss management and management of work comp insurance. That's just the fact. And the reason is, is because if you have a person that does not come back in some type of restricted or transitional duty, um, a lot of times the arbitrators uh, will take a look and assign a higher permanency or award value because they think the case is more severe if the person wasn't able to go back to work in some capacity. Now, they're not supposed to do that, but they routinely do. Return to work is another thing that is really important for public safety employees, because as I mentioned earlier, in Illinois, they get 100% of their salary tax-free after an injury. So if you don't have a return to work program, those persons are gonna get 100% of their salary for sitting at home. So it's important to have those folks come back. They won't decondition if they're coming to the agency. These are really important things in trying to make sure that they keep, you keep them um, working instead of them just being home and then deconditioning starts, they start talking to attorneys and the wheels come off the track. So we work a lot on transitional duty programs um, and you can put time limits on it. If you are sensitive that a person may be off and you've had return to work, oh, they were on light duty, I hate that term, but they were on light duty or modified duty for a year. Well, they shouldn't be. Put a time limit on it. 
90 days, 180 days. That will prove to the arbitrators and the commission that you've made a good faith effort to try to bring them back, but it can't create a hardship to your organization. It just can't. And it also really helps in the impact and severity of the claim because you've demonstrated that the person can work in some capacity, um, but for whatever reason, they just they couldn't get past the transitional nature to get back to a full duty or their pre-injury pre level of employment and physical activity. So those are five key areas that you should really look to build out for the sophistication or to improve your sophistication for your program. Now, everybody is different on their scale of sophistication and the ladder, we call it. But what you want to do is continuously build out these things because it will have a definitive impact on your insurance premium and the cycle or the cyclical nature of how those premiums go up and down. These five areas are really the fundamentals of work comp insurance management. And without them, you're going to be at a disadvantage and you will have more losses. The lost needle is going to be in the frustrating level instead of the acceptable level. And I mentioned this before, management and intervention strategies. You know, I said, why do we break the speed limit? Because there's no consequence every time that we do. You know, Bob and I are going to dra drive home and um, I'm sure that I'll be north of the speed limit, but there will still be people passing me. And again, I'm conditioned to know that that's acceptable, even though I know that I'm breaking the law. I'm a risk manager that's a, that's a rule breaker. So I stand up here before you in, a, you know, in transparency. And, you know, everybody is, has these characteristics and these tendencies. It's a wiring and conditioning thing that we go through in our brain. And I mentioned this earlier too. You know, is there a difference between like Christopher Parent and someone walking across the street that's you know, about to be hit by a car or that we can have some intervention opportunities? I feel really, really bad for Chris Parent. I mean, just the first time I watched the video, it tugged at my heartstrings because I thought, well, how did it get to this level? Why did it take so long to get to this level? And why didn't anybody do anything before it got to this level? Before it hit the news? I mean, come on. We should all have more compassion to try to keep like Chris Parent out of the news. I feel terrible for the guy. And critical institutional controls, and this is what we kind of measure every time that we go into an organization. It's the hiring, it's, the, it's physicals, fitness for duty, drug screening, integrity, and personality testing. We push that really hard because we know that that's going to influence and shape the quality of the employee that we bring on on behalf of the organization. We know there's less insurance activity when we bring quality people in. They don't have deep senses of entitlement. They don't think that they're trying to game the system. I mentioned injury prevention and response services. Uh, it's, the injury prevention is where it's at. You stop the claim from happening, and then you're going to stop all the frustrations that go along with it. And also be looking for people that are vulnerable. You know the unhealthy people in your organization. There's no harm in bringing them into your organization and asking if they need help with anything. Do you have access to all the you know, resources that you need to be able to control and to be able to help your own physical health? I think people would welcome that conversation, but when I talk to chiefs, when I talk to supervisors and leadership command staff, to a T, 99% of them do not have those conversations. They just don't have the confidence. They think it's off limits. That's their decision, not ours. Yeah, but they're representing you and they're doing physical work for you? It is your responsibility. Modify return to work is one of the most important response things that you can have in place after a claim happens. If you don't have transitional duty programs, please talk to someone from Kano. I have countless samples of policies, and I will share with them free of charge, no charge. I want you guys to have these things. So if you're interested, please let us know, and we'll make sure that we share those policies and those resources with you. Post-accident drug testing. Post-accident impairment testing, I like to call it now. Um, I don't like to call it drug testing anymore. Impairment testing I'm, I'm much more fond of because it really directly correlates to a particular incident. But if you do do post-accident drug testing, make sure that you have a good policy. You know where you're sending you know, people for specimen collection and things like that. I know people are getting away from doing some of the drug testing for pre-employment, and I'm okay with that. I mean, listen, in Illinois, marijuana is you know, recreationally legal now, so... If someone goes and does an edible one weekend and I'm trying to test and see if they're a candidate, I'm not going to try to you know, kick them out for that. Motor vehicle records checks. Um, you know, we have a lot of drivers and 
for our organizations that very few of us do MVR checks. If you don't, um, you're really increasing your liability. Uh, we had one public entity that we worked with on the south side of Chicago that um, they issued a, a organizational car to, and this guy had two DUIs in the past, and he was out on a organizational function, a charitable function one night, got all boozed up, and went the wrong way on an exit ramp on the interstate, and hit two families head on, and wiped one of them out. So, they were deliberately indifferent to his motor vehicle records. They weren't checking it. Instant liability. So our counsel, you know what they say in a situation like that? Get the checkbook out and write the check. So and we hate hearing that. Make sure that you have job descriptions that have accurate physical demands on there. And by physical demands, it's not just the lifting. You have to actually have all the different tolerances on there. Their standing tolerances, or their standing tolerance, their climbing tolerance, their stairs, sitting. All these tolerances have to be documented. And it doesn't have to be exact that this is what they have to do at 7.4 hours of the day. It's all in percentages. But that way, an organization that you send someone to for essential functions te testing or fitness or duty testing, they know what to test. They know what to build the test for. Many organizations, a lot of our police and fire, they want to have a physical standard, but very few of them are willing to actually adopt a physical standard. And there is no standard for law enforcement across the nation because each department operationally is so distinct and different. And so I challenged them. I said, you just can't say that they have to run a one mile in X and they have to do this many pull-ups of X and they have to do you know, this many push-ups. It's just, it's not job, job related. We talked to all the legal experts in this. You have to make it job specific. If you have a phys uh, fitness or duty program, you have to have it job specific in the testing that you do. So if that means that they have to occasionally run in burst of 150 yards, that's what you have to test. Not a sustained run of three miles. No one does a foot pursuit of three miles. So make sure your job descriptions are accurate and they have accurate physical demands and also tolerances listed. listed. Finally, I included PPE in here because um, a lot of our members, um, and I'm sure maybe you guys too, um, were kind of caught on the wrong side of the PPE, um, your, what you had available. Um, <clears throat> we're encouraging more and more people to make sure that they have a stock of PPE. We're giving grants, instant grants, to make sure that they have that stock. Listen, I came from a hospital, so I, it's just, it's unimaginable for me to think about not having personal protective equipment. When we went in negative pressure rooms, I mean, we had two people that were helping us actually put all of our you know, PPE on to make sure that we were putting it on right and putting it off right. High risk stuff, really high risk stuff. And then I mentioned the claim reporting. And is Jeff in here or Aaron? I don't know, Aaron, if you guys wanted to cover anything in claim reporting that Connell gives assistance on or if there's anything that you want to tie in here. Um, I, know that the, I know that there's a strong HR component of Kano that really helps their clients, and there's a strong HR component that's involved with some of the work comp things that we have obligations on. So I encourage you to make sure that when it comes to filling out the claim and turning in the claim to the insurance carrier or your, the work comp provider, make sure that you coordinate that with, Tim, or with Kano and his group because they keep records of it. I mean, they make sure that you have all of your I's dotted and T's crossed. Questions? It's, it's funny, because I, I came in today. I had no idea how long I had to speak. I, whenever I walk into this place, I say, how, how long do I have? And I walked in with Jeff today, and we were thinking it was 40 or 45 minutes. He goes, can you do two hours? How about three? I said, we can do that. <laughs> so. We appreciate the opportunity to stand in front of you, the audience today, and I can tell you, I speak all across the country, and this is the first session that I've had in this big of a group in, since 2019 in December. So it is great to be back in front of a group. I appreciate your interest because, listen, I know this can be dry stuff. No one wants to go to a work comp insurance seminar on a Friday. I get it. 
Um, but this stuff is important for a couple different reasons. Number one, because the taxpayer you know, element of some of the funding that goes involved. Number two, it's just, it, it has such an impact on the budget for a lot of the business operators in here. Um, and also, is it's just it's the right thing to do. You know, we want to make sure that we're doing work comp. We do it the right way. We protect people, um, and we get them back to work. Is there questions or anything? Yes, ma'am. So the question was, how do, I, how do we feel about incentivized like, programs, like um, free days for no accidents and things like that? Uh, the, the huge global equipment manufacturer that I, did, I worked at had a similar program. And um, everybody got put into a lottery. And if they went so many days without a lost work day, um, they did a drawing and then someone got something. Well, what they were finding is they were having delays in claim reporting because they didn't want to screw up the, the period for everybody to get access to a draw. The other part of it is I hate the idea of incentivizing some, something that they're supposed to be doing in the first place. So it's, their requirement is to work safe. Um, I have one of my consultants that buys $100 worth of gas cards. And whenever they go around and do their surveys for like some of the site activity, if they're wearing their high vis and their eye protection and their head hard hats, he gives them a $10 gas card. I, lo I love little things like that because that's, that's rewarding people in the moment for something that they're doing specifically. But if people start thinking about gaming the system as a result of it, I always have some reluctancy to it. Other questions or comments? The question is, how do you balance you know, the, the demand of really trying to hire police officers with some of the requirements that we're actually asking them to participate in? And I've argued now for years that we need to do more to professionalize um, police officers, the profession, uh, and also to get them operating at a higher level of physical condition, physical function. You make it a culture of the, of the organization, and you start and say, this is something that we're going to voluntarily do with existing employees, because we can't force it on your existing employees now, because they've been working in this capacity for so long. You can ask them to voluntarily participate in it, and for all new hires, this is the way that we operate now. These are the policies that we operate. These are the demands that we have for fitness for duty. And... Um, what sometimes you might have to pay a little bit more, which is a challenge. I get it, because not everybody has the capability to do that. But if you want to attract that type of caliber of professionalism, you may actually have to pay more for it. So we are going through horrific changes in Illinois around law enforcement right now. Um, Jeff and I got an email was this morning on, um, on a new law that they passed. I mean, they did a police reform bill in Illinois that has... It has an existential threat to the way that law enforcement is, is administered right now in Illinois. Um, you know, from qualified immunity all the way down to punitive fees and attorney's fees for uh, the state filed claims. I mean, it's just, it's, it's way different. So to get to your question, it's going to impact how we actually hire for talent. Who's going to want to become a police officer now? Every day in the press. So when I got into this line of business, 80% of my time used to be devoted to workers' compensation. It was just it had that much demand and a coverage. Now my time is split. I bet I spend 60% of my time on law enforcement liability related work and the 40% is more on work comp. It's just, it's, it's a bad climate for, for police officers. And it's not just for the liability and constitutional law nature of it, it's for their own safety as well. Let's, let's think about the George Floyd and the uh, Derek Chauvin, the, the police officer that was involved with George Floyd. I have such anger towards his fellow officers that they didn't intervene and stop that. That they didn't recognize that that Chauvin was having just the worst possible moment and didn't interrupt that. It's the same opportunity that they would have had to try to stop him from you know, getting hit by a car or, or walking off, you know, a sidewalk that's, that had a big you know, blank in it. It's, they had the chance to stop that from happening, and they didn't do it. Duty to intervene. Those guys had duty to intervene, and they didn't act on it. So that's a cultural issue. How is that officer going to get a fair trial? I'm not, I'm not talking about the guilt or the not guilt. 
How is he going to get a fair trial when there's a federal bill named after the gentleman that he's accused of killing? He's never going to get a fair trial. And those other officers that were standing there and, and didn't do anything, they had a chance to stop all that. They had a chance to save George Floyd's life. They had a chance to save that Darren Chauvin's life, too. Eric Chauvin, I'm sorry. That's, it, it's, I still have such a hard time with that. And I look at it, a lot of the people in here, and I just think that if, if we saw something that's horrific as happening, I think that we would all want to try to intervene and stop that. I really do. So to getting back, it's not going to be easy to hire our police officers. And um, it's, we're, we're seeing in Illinois a mass exodus of senior-level police officers leaving you know, the profession. And uh, they may be close to their pension age. There's no doubt about that. But... Um, recent events have definitely put the, the pressure on and the accelerator for people trying to get out of the profession. So it's not going to get easier for us. And if we're going to require them to meet a certain physical standard, then we may have to actually incentivize it or pay them more. Um, but what, what can that do for avoiding liability and future safety considerations down the line? I used to argue with our healthcare organizations that used to buy, hire at CNAs. I said, don't do it. We need a body you know what, you're hiring a liability expense to employ. It's a number to me. It's just like it's, it's data that they, if they detune themselves to, it's just how do you operate that way? It's, it's just fascinating. Other questions? Okay, well, I hope everybody has a, a good Friday and a great weekend. Please be safe traveling home. I mean, I know it was a little bit foggy this morning. I don't know what the conditions are right now. I thank you for being such a gracious audience and for your patience. I thank Tim and Jeff and the Kano Group for having us. Um, I can't imagine a better, better business partner that we have been introduced to um, here in Missouri. And uh, it started really with Aaron. Aaron and I were at a conference together where I was speaking at, and then we sat and talked afterwards, and it, it kind of expanded from there. And uh, Aaron is like, a little bit like me, I and mean, a lot like me. I think we're, we're both solutionists. We like the tougher challenges of the problems. We like pursuing and solving those. And um, we like being in the action uh, where it's at. So if there's ways that we can help you or ways that you can think of that you know, we might be able to offer a resource or make you aware of a service, we are more than happy to oblige you in that. So thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. Brian, everybody, thank you so much, Brian. Great content, highly technical, and yes, I even get excited about workers' compensation.